when I first, when we first walked into the auditorium and I saw those beautiful flowers on the table, I thought, you know, isn't that nice for the organizers to get flowers for all of us speakers? And it turns out that's not the case, that the flowers are actually for our next speaker, Dr. Sandra Steingraber. There's a, there's a group in the audience that have provided her with these flowers on behalf of mothers and grandmothers. I think you're going to get a lot of applauses. I'm not even done yet. Um, on behalf of mothers and grandmothers who appreciate uh, her life's work and to publicly acknowledge her recent receipt of the very prestigious Heinz Award um, for her work on environmental uh, health. <laughs> Dr. Steingraber is a scholar in residence at Ithaca College and has a doctorate in biology from the University of Michigan, as well as a master's in English from Illinois State University. She's an ecologist and cancer survivor who studies the impacts of environmental toxins um, on human health. In her book and film, her great book and film, Living Downstream, Dr. Steingraber documented her personal experiences with cancer and the chemical contamination in our air, water, and land. Over the past year, she has been exploring hydraulic fracturing for a column in Orion Magazine, as well as in her forthcoming book on environmental threats to children's development. She has recently returned from a 20-state tour uh, researching the effects of hydrofracking on communities through the United States, and we're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Sandra Steingraber. Well, it's a really, it's an incredible honor to be here. Um, you have a beautiful community, and uh, I was admiring the flowers before I knew they were for, for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I'm not going to show you slides, but I, have, I do have some audio, uh, well, some visual aids I'm going to bring out in a minute. But, but I wanna, what I want to do first is to take you on a journey to a place that you can't see. There are no PowerPoint presentations of this place. And it's, it's the subterranean landscape below our feet, the Marcellus Shale itself. Um, so let's, let's start there. Uh, 500 million years ago, upstate New York was a shallow ocean full of sea lilies and squids. And when these creatures died, they sank into the sediments of the sea floor and became bubbles of methane. Um, and there was a reason for that. The, uh, there was a certain amount of oxygen in the atmosphere at the time. But there were no land plants yet. This predated it, uh, all the trees that we just learned a lot about. Uh, and so because there's not enough oxygen, they, their bodies wouldn't decompose the way ours did. So that's why they ended up as methane bubbles uh, instead of uh, rotting the way things do now. So to the east of the shallow ocean, uh, there, there was a, a, a large uh, mountain range uh, uh, where the Catskills are now, and that mountain range entirely eroded into the ocean. And mountains, you know, contain a lot of elements inside, uh, inside of them. Um, and all those elements uh, eroded with the silt uh, into this inland ocean. And, and some of those are uh, arsenic and lead, mercury and strontium, which is radioactive. Um, and they also became part of this seafloor. So as all of those uh, particles of silt, you know, dust is called silt when you add it to water, but it's the same stuff. So all this dust fell into the ocean, uh, and, and as long as the ocean is very still, uh, which this ocean was, the, the dust will settle out as silt, uh, land on top of those methane bubbles and all those heavy metals, and then get pressed into shale. So, so that's how we came to have this Marcellus shale under our feet, about, uh, it lies down there about a mile below us. So it's a kind of petrified fizz of, of champagne bubbles trapped in rock that's suffused with the salty brine, the original uh, salt water of the ocean, but which now has now had a chance to concentrate. So it's 17 times more salty than uh, ocean water. And, and all these kind of metals and radioactive isotopes. As long as we leave all that intact, uh, it's not hurting anybody. Although it does contribute radon to our basements. As you know, the Marcellus Shale is a, a kind of a, a radon intensive area. Uh, and so we have to do things uh, even a mile above to sort of mitigate the radon that kind of comes up from this thing. Um, but other than that, it's mostly, uh, you know, it's our bedrock. It's, it's our kind of uh, subterranean national landscape. Uh, and if we use water and toxic chemicals as a club to shatter it, in order to bring those bubbles of gas to the surface, we really do open a Pandora's box. 
So you heard about some of the ecological effects, what will happen to our landscape if it's industrialized. And I want to uh, talk to you now about some of the health effects to, to ourselves. Um, and a, as a way of introduction, I want to point out that um, I've described this Marcellus shale as a sort of graveyard of, of squids and lilies. And that's true. But it's also a living ecosystem. And that is a fact, I think, really underappreciated. I hardly hear any conversation about this. The Marcellus shale is alive. It's full of organisms, um, very strange organisms, some of which have uh, arsenic in their DNA instead of phosphorus. And, and these organisms in general are, are called extremophiles. They're able to live at very uh, salty uh, conditions, very hot conditions, very acidic conditions, and so forth. So the Marcellus shell is really more like a coral reef than it is kind of an inert uh, bunch of rocks down there. And all of these uh, organisms geologists now call deep life. That's the sort of generic name for them all. Um, and uh, it, only in the last year uh, have geologists fully appreciated that in terms of just sheer biomass, they suspect now that there are more living organisms in the deep geological strata under our feet than there are in the world's oceans. So we're, there's talking about a lot of, of living things that, down there. And these things are, um, take the form of uh, fungus and bacteria and things that don't even have um, categories on, on, on the surface. So the old idea that the living world only exists on the surface of the earth and that uh, underneath the earth is just kind of dead, inert, elemental stuff is, is not true, uh, as we now know. And, and the reason I think that's important uh, for us in terms of a conversation about health is because it explains why these powerful poisons have to be used to get the, the, uh, the bubbles of gas out. Like, why couldn't you just use fresh water as a, uh, under tremendous amounts of pressure and just blow up the shale and get the gas out? Um, well, there, first of all, there's a lot of friction, so you need surfactants. But um, why, still, why does it have to be so poisonous? And the answer is, you need biocides. You need poisons to kill off all those organisms. Because otherwise, they slime up the pipes and they inhibit the flow of gas. So one of the main reasons that um, so many really toxic chemicals, the carcinogens, the things that in pregnancies, um, things that are associated with brain damage, um, things that uh, can make you infertile, the reason they have to be used is because uh, the Marcel shale is alive. Um, and, uh, and, and then in a more, larger, more philosophical way, we really don't know what that ecosystem down there contributes, how it's connected to the surface world. Because uh, these organisms do things like they send out nanowires, all right, I won't get, I get really excited about the biology and I won't go into it too much, but let me just say, everything that walks around the surface of the Earth has something called an electron transport system, which helps move electrons through cells because otherwise you'd get oxidative stress and, and you'd blow up. You know, that, that's why you take vitamins, right? So you, you uh, kill off all that uh, uh, oxidative pro problems that you have with excess electrons. But there's no way to do that way down under the Earth's surface. And so these organisms can actually grow little nanowires out into the elements around them and send electrons out and attach them onto the rocks that they live around. So they're actively modifying their environment to suit themselves. Um, and in, in so doing, they are actually altering the, elementals, uh, the elements of the Earth in, in, and changing the cycles of elements in ways that may actually, some geologists believe, help stabilize the climate. So in addition to needing to use chemicals um, to kill this stuff off that then have health effects for us, um, we're also destroying uh, a living ecosystem and we, without any real knowledge of how, what role it might play in the larger functioning of, uh, of the biosphere. Uh, and as an ecologist, um, that concerns me. Um, we have no idea what we're doing, and we do, it's not as though we have a spare planet to go try this out on to see what the consequences are. We can't test this out in the laboratory um, and determine it's safe before we, we, we start. We, we are the laboratory um, here. Okay, so the, uh, the health effects for us really um, involve exposures to multiple media, which is why I think the Marcellus shale uh, is probably the biggest environmental health issue of our time, um, because we are exposed to chemicals both through, uh, uh, potentially through water and through air and through food, and because so many of us live on top of the Marcellus shale. So this isn't like fracking out in um, western and eastern New Mexico, where I also visited this summer. Um, there are problems 
doing it out there as well, uh, primarily because there's no water. We have water, um, but we also have lots of people. And uh, all the places I visited out west, mostly nobody lives there where a lot of fracking is going on. And people still have grave concerns, and they should, because they're using up a lot of water. Thus, uh, the story I told at dinner tonight about going through the panhandle of Texas this summer, um, you, you know, it's experiencing ruinous drought, uh, the worst drought on record in 100 and some years of record keeping. Um, that 99% of dry land cotton is gone. Cattle are being sold off. Food production is way down. And yet the fracking trucks are rolling. Um, I, I, I saw a so hand lettered sign in a front yard where it looked like a moonscape on a ranch that said, I need water, you haul, I pay. And, and the fracking trucks rolled right on by, taking water millions of gallons to the, to the gas wells. And to me, this was the kind of logic of a drug addict, you know, who uh, takes the money they should be feeding their children with, growing food for goodness sake, and, and instead they're feeding an addiction. I mean, if you, if, if you have to blast methane out of the ground instead of growing food, something's gone terribly wrong with, with, uh, with the way we run our economy. And of course, here in the Marcellus, the Marcellus is the food shed. We are the food shed for New York, and we're the air shed for New York City. Um, the only reason that New York City is habitable um, because it generates a lot of air pollution, is because it's not inside a bowl uh, 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 with surrounded by mountains. Uh, the westerly winds bring the fresh air from here to New York City and push its pollution uh, out. So if we blanket our area in, a, in smog, um, then it's not just us whose health uh, begins to suffer. So let, let me start with, with air pollution then. Um, because we actually know quite a lot about uh, this part of the, the health threats posed by fracking. Air pollution is an inevitable consequence of horizontal hydrofracking. So I would place it in the same category as the industrialization of our landscape um, in, in that we know this is going to happen. There's absolutely no doubt about it, and it's not mitigatable. Uh, it's not the outcome of a catastrophic accident. It's not a hypothetical risk. Compromised air quality is a certainty. Um, it requires four to nine million gallons of fresh water to frack a single well. Um, and we're, we're imagining now 77,000 uh, wells here in upstate New York. That's the state of New York's own uh, data. Each well requires 1,000 truck trips, 1,000 in, 1,000 out. Um, so that's 77,000 wells times 1,000 truck trips. That's a lot of zeros, uh, a number with a lot of zeros. And, and that, of course, then is going to be a prodigious amount of diesel exhaust. In addition uh, to the endless fleets of 18-wheelers, uh, gas production requires generators and pumps and drill rigs. Uh, it's 10,000 pounds per square inch of pressure to blow up the bedrock a mile below our feet. Um, so that requires, uh, that's all fossil fuel uh, being burned to exert that pressure. Um, and then, uh, of course, the wellheads themselves vent volatile organic chemicals such as benzene and toluene. Um, and those are chemicals that are actually uh, trapped inside the rock itself. Um, so it's not just methane that's down there. That's the, what we're after. That's the quarry. Um, but there are also other um, volatile organic solvents like benzene and toluene. Um, and, and those themselves are highly toxic and can combine with uh, com combustion byproducts from the tailpipe of all those trucks uh, to create uh, ozone, ground level ozone, which is what we call smog. And, and this kind of air pollution is lethal. We have a lot of good data about it. We know that, um, it, that uh, smog and diesel exhaust contain uh, lots of ultrafine particles um, and the carcinogen benzoapyrene. Um, and those are chemicals that are linked to bladder, lung, and breast cancer stroke and diabetes and premature death. And in children, they're linked to preterm birth, asthma, cognitive deficits, and stunted lung development. Now, as you know, the, uh, the statement that was just released um, by the state of New York, the, um, the environmental impact statement, does not include health effects. And so there has been no accounting of the, the monetary cost um, uh, that comes with these medical problems. We could do this. That we, you could run these numbers and do it, but nobody has. Um, uh, we know as a nation that preterm birth, for example, which is the leading cause of disability in this country, uh, carries a $26 billion a year price tag. 
Um, and the direct and indirect costs of asthma are about $18 billion a year. Asthma is also the leading cause of school absenteeism. We know that uh, special educational services, um, the, the need rises the more you have attention deficit disorders and different kinds of uh, learning disabilities. We know that uh, exposure to smog in uh, early life, especially during pregnancy, raises the risk for those things. Um, uh, in other words, breathing polluted air just makes kids more stupid than they would. It shaves off IQ points. Um, we, all, we already know that we spend 25%, well, 22%, about a quarter of uh, all of our uh, spending on public education, which of course is our money, has to be devoted now to special educational services and the need is rising. So given that, in the last round of budget cuts in New York State, we just slashed money to the schools and we're trying to slash uh, health care costs, how does it make sense to uh, expose us all to chemicals that we know, uh, for, for some of us, are going to lead to outcomes that are uh, ruinously expensive to our health care system and to our public school systems? And again, these costs have not, uh, somebody could, uh, they're all kind of models to show, um, for example, how much, um, the health care costs associated with coal mining is costing the state of West Virginia. And it turns out it costs the state of West Virginia more revenue than it's generated by coal mining. Um, and there are numbers uh, that have been generated for California to talk about uh, workplace exposure to toxic chemicals and how much money is taken out of the uh, public coffers in California to try to take care of all the people who are so affected. So we could, we could do this analysis, but it, has not, uh, it hasn't been done. What's more, the airborne contaminants from gas drilling travel long distances, up to 200 miles, which means that our air quality here is already affected from everything you just heard that's going on in Pennsylvania. Um, I, for one, have noticed a lot more uh, air alert uh, days in the southern tier of New York uh, and the, in the Ithaca area than have, I've ever known in the years that I've, I've lived here. And in fact, we had our first one very early this year in May. I've never seen an ozone alert uh, in this part of the world in in May before. Is that related to the drilling that's going on just 60 miles from us in, uh, in Pennsylvania? Uh, it's very likely that it is. We know uh, in areas of Arkansas and Texas, uh, far from the gas patch, um, uh, air quality is degraded from um, uh, both the volatile organics from the wellheads as well as all the tailpipe uh, emissions from operations. Um, but again, we haven't, um, nobody's modeled this, nobody's taken a look at uh, the cumulative effects of all the wells in, in Pennsylvania added to all the wells I have in mind for us here to see what kind of air quality we're actually talking about. It could be done, it hasn't been done. We do know that the gas producing areas of Utah and Wyoming, where there were formerly pristine air, now contains more ozone than downtown Los Angeles. And as a mother of a child with a history of uh, asthma and respiratory problems, this really con concerns me. Because New York and Pennsylvania is not, are not Wyoming. We have a lot of industry that goes on here already. Uh, we're not starting off with a baseline of pristine. Uh, we're at the tailpipe end of the ho whole Ohio Valley, and re we receive emissions already. We have molecules of soot in our lungs from coal burning power plants in the Ohio Valley. Um, so if you're going to add all this stuff on top of it, um, we could start to have uh, really bad air much more quickly than um, Wyoming or eastern Utah. Uh, when I traveled around um, this summer to begin exploratory research on um, how fracking affects communities, what I heard a lot about was not so much uh, about smog. I mean, that's what I study as a biologist, but pe what people wanted to talk to me about were the acute effects on, the, on public health of having that kind of truck traff density in their communities. Um, and, uh, and frankly, it's terrifying to drive on roads with those kind of vehicles. Um, we were run off the road by a fracking truck in North Dakota, um, and I saw what I'm sure uh, was, was a fatality um, in somewhere in on the border area between Montana and North Dakota. Um, it was a terrifying looking uh, car accident in, involving, I can't, uh, you know, I was just a drive-by, so I can't say it was a fracking truck, but it sure looked like it could have been. Um, and the grim look on the face of the sheriff who waved us by and the absence of any ambulance um, made me believe that this did not end well at all. 
Um, and, and that's what people wanted to talk about, was the, it, the, how their lives had been changed um, by their roadways being filled with 18-wheelers, just fleets and fleets of them hauling hazardous materials. Um, and I began to imagine myself, uh, what would these roads look like that I drive along um, that were designed to take farmers to market by horse and buggy, right? Um, here in upstate New York, um, where the, we have a lot higher population density, you know, there's hardly any speed limit in, in eastern Montana, and the roads just go straight, and, uh, and yet terrible accidents are happening. <laughs> um, what would it be like around here, uh, where we have ice storms, where things aren't just straight, where things are very curvy and narrow and, se and so forth? And then I try to imagine myself as the mother of a 12-year-old who will be teaching that child to drive uh, on these roads, uh, and it's not acceptable. Um, that alone would make me feel like I couldn't live here uh, if, if fracking came. And I was at, I was spoke earlier today in uh, Scania Adels and was asked a question by the Chamber of Congress about what they could expect, um, how it would affect tourism to the area. Um, and uh, I, there was not really a question I can answer except to say that um, I, I can't imagine anyone wanting to come on vacation if they had to share the roadways here um, with fleets of 18 wheelers and lots and lots of toxic m materials. Um, uh, I just I would think that those folks would just go to Vermont instead. Um, all right, so let me talk now about water. Each of us in this room are 65% water by weight, and as such, we enjoy an exquisite communion, not only with our atmosphere, but also with the water cycle. Fracking turns millions of gallons of fresh water into poisonous flowback fluid that requires permanent disposal. And again, that's unchangeable. You know, you, you just you can't get around that. Um, the technology does not exist to turn this waste into drinkable water, um, nor remove radioactive isotopes. You simply can't filter radioactivity. And what happened in Japan um, when the tsunami led to a nuclear disaster, I think, made that really clear. Um, once uh, water and milk and things like that become radioactive, you can't, there's no filter. You can kind of run it through to remediate uh, the problem. Uh, the current proposal is to take all this poisonous flowback fluid and put it onto trucks and carry it into Ohio for disposal in uh, deep wells there. Uh, and in fact, the woman that I was debating this morning, um, who is giving the pro-fracking argument, uh, touted this as an excellent solution, um, noting that therefore we wouldn't be dumping it here, right? It's going to be sent to Ohio. Um, and. Um, I thought that was a bit stunning. I didn't really have a comeback to that. Uh, the, the, uh, the, she's right, though, in that we don't have the geology that allows for deep well injections here in New York State, uh, meaning that there are other places uh, west of us. Uh, my own home state of Illinois is another one, Ohio also, in which uh, it's permissible to, to dig a deep hole way down into the ground and inject under high pressure toxic waste and just entomb it down there and hope for the best that it's never going to come back. So uh, the, the, old the old idea was we could just take this stuff and dump it through our sewage treatment plants. And, uh, and Pennsylvania learned a really bad lesson with that. A lot of people in Pittsburgh couldn't drink their water. There was so much bromide and so forth. And so now the new plan is to take it all to uh, Ohio. But the point is it's, it can't go away. It doesn't. It, you can't make it vanish. So we're going to continue and continue to generate trillions of gallons of what used to be drinkable water, turn it into poison. There's no technology in the world that exists now that can turn it back into drinkable water. So the only thing to do with it is find a really deep hole and bury it as, as deep as you can, whether we do that here or in Ohio. We know that there are about 1,000 uh, now documented cases of surface and groundwater contamination with compounds associated with gas extraction, including the carcinogen benzene. So if anyone says there are absolutely no confirmed cases of water contamination caused by fracking, that is absolutely an untruthful statement. There are more than 1,000 documented cases now. The, the trick is in the parsing of the language, right? And it's this sort of Clinton-esque, what is the meaning of is? So. Um, when, when, when you hear the phrase, there's no contamination um, caused by fracking, uh, if the word fracking only refers to the moment where you're actually blowing up the shale and fracturing it, who knows? That may be a true statement. I don't think anybody actually has data on that. 
Um, but the point is that we're not just affected by the moment that we're fractured. We're also affected by all the road building and the gas pipes and the flowback fluid and the hauling and the possible accidents by trucks and so forth. And so if you want to say, if you want to use the word fracking to refer to the entire process, the entire industrial process, then it's a truthful statement to say we have a thousand documented cases of surface and groundwater contamination with compounds associated with gas extraction, including the carcinogen benzene. However, because hydraulic fracturing has been granted the environmental equivalent of diplomatic immunity and enjoys special exemptions from both the Clean Water Act and the Clean Drinking Water Act, it's difficult for those of us in the research community to quantify the public health consequences because we lack information about the specifics of what chemicals are, are being used. Um, and we also lack knowledge about the behavior of groundwater. So we don't know even what chemicals to test from, to, te to test for. Although we do know now that uh, drinking water wells near gas extraction sites in both Pennsylvania and New York, and these are now ver vertical well sites, um, have on average about 17 times higher methane levels than wells located farther away. Now, when I was asked to testify before um, the uh, State Assembly of New York on the health consequences of fracking, the senators asked me a lot of questions about uh, the methane and what we know about the health effects of drinking methane. Um, and I researched this pretty thoroughly, and it, it turns out there's nothing in the medical literature about it because we've never really exposed large populations to a bunch of methane in water before, and so there's never been any reason to do that study. So I tried to find out, you know, what's the consequences of inhaling uh, methane and drinking it for pregnant women, for children, for people with heart conditions, for anybody. The studies have just not been done. We, and, and the federal government doesn't regulate methane in drinking water, so it's hard to get uh, any data. But what we do know is that methane being a, a, a substance made of carbon, um, if you chlorinate that water, you will form disinfection byproducts, so-called trihalomethanes, um, such as chloroform, which is a carcinogen. And these things are actually linked to bladder and colon cancer. Um, and, and so um, in public drinking water, it may be really important that methane is in the water because it's a feedstock to make inadvertent uh, inadvertently, an inadvertent feedstock to make other chemicals when we chlorinate water either in the sewage treatment plant or in, in the actual um, drinking water facility itself so we don't all, you know, die from cholera. So, uh, food. Um, this is another uh, part of the uh, story that was really left out, I think, of the environmental uh, impact statement that was just released. How will hydrofracking affect uh, food production and how will it affect the chemical contaminants in food? Um, in spite of the fact that uh, not, there's not a lot of data about it, I have a tremendous number of concerns, um, especially because we're a dairy state. And what we know about milk uh, is that cesium follows calcium in the body of cows so that whenever there's a radioactive accident, um, cesium shows up in milk. We know that uh, dairy in Ver as far east as Vermont um, bore the signs of radioactive contamination from uh, the fallout from Japan um, uh, earlier this year. Um, so it's uh, possible when you have cutting fluids that are highly radioactive, they're being dumped in landfills right next to pastures, you have a, p a potential pathway to contaminate uh, our, our dairy supply. Um, but more interestingly to me, even than that, um, and I guess I just want to, as a, um, to, to wrap that piece up, I think all that would have to happen is that the discovery would be made that some milk in New York State is radioactive, and that would be it for our tourism industry. <laughs> or, you know, that some, some, somebody's winery had some kind of fracking chemical in it. It wouldn't matter. Whose, whose winery it was or whose specific dairy it was, we're all, we'd all be affected negatively. No one would want to spend their vacation here again. They would just go somewhere else, um, which, would, which would be my long answer to the question about how will this affect tourism, I guess. Upstate New York is the national hotspot for organic agriculture as identified by the New York Times. It's the most rapidly expanding sector of our state food production system here, and it's continued to grow even during the economic downfield. 
Um, the cow, we have cows, wheat fields, vineyards, maple syrup, apple orchards. They're all part of a healthy human food chain. They're the kind of foods we want to feed our ki kids. They're part of the answer to the obesity problem. And they all require clean water, and they're all affected badly by exposure to both air and, and water uh, pollution. Uh, in uh, Not far from here, in a little village named Mecklenburg, there's uh, a bakery called the Wide Awake Bakery that sources with local organic wheat farmers that have introduced back to upstate New York heirloom wheat varieties that used to be uh, the staple here. You know, New York used to be the kind of breadbasket, literally, for the Northeast. Um, but when settlers from Crimea um, brought hard wheat varieties out to Kansas and Nebraska, um, they upstaged us. Uh, and now there's a resurrection of all those old varieties of wheat that used to grow here in the cool, wet conditions of upstate New York. Um, and one of those bakeries that's learning how to uh, resurrect the old recipes to make artisanal breads is White, White Awake Bakery. They sell loaves for something like $9 a loaf when they sell their uh, uh, wheat to bakeries in Brooklyn. So the mill to grind it is in my village of Trumansburg. The mill would like to hire. Um, the bakery would like to hire, the farmers would like to expand, but all the land uh, around them has been leased to the gas industry. Um, and because no one knows what's going to happen, the whole thing has been kind of put on ice. And so my children love Wide Awake Bakery. You can't get enough of it. It's always sold out. Um, and here's an opportunity for jobs, good jobs, not toxic jobs, that are sustainable um, and uh, would keep the money right here. Um, which raises in my mind a question, um, is the human health of New York best served by jobs that involve organic bread production or fossil fuel extraction? All right, to wrap up, and then I'm going to show you my uh, visual aids over there. Um, I, when I was invited to Scania Atlas um, this morning, I had the opportunity to drive back, drive by Harriet Tubman's house right outside of Auburn. And I was reminded the, of the incredible risks that she took um, to, in the Underground Railroad to go into slave territory and, and liberate slaves, and then later as a spy for the Union Army. Um, and she made a big point, as did the abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy uh, from my home state of Illinois, which is the namesake for my son, Elijah. Uh, both of them made a big point that um, you can't regulate slavery. Because they were both living in a time when we tried to be half slave and half free, and maybe Kansas could, and maybe it couldn't, and maybe we won't bring any new slaves over, but everybody can have their old slaves. And, um, and finally, abolitionism was the only approach we had to take. Um, and as both Elijah Lovejoy and Harriet Tubman argued, no matter how much our economy between the 1830s and the 1860s was it dependent on slave labor, no matter how much more competitive it made us in the world market, no matter how it lowered the cost of goods, and so many people's personal wealth was bound up in, and it was all a matter of private property, no matter all of that, no matter what cost to the social structure by suddenly freeing a whole bunch of slaves, it, slavery was a homicidal abomination. That was the fundamental bottom line, and it had to stop, and it had to stop now. And New Yorkers played this key role in that movement, as they did in the, in, uh, the women's rights movement. So I imagine us now at a time where I just saw fracking you know, happen across the United States with all kinds of, nobody's happy about it. I didn't meet a single community who said, this is the best thing that ever happened to this community. I mean, everybody's looking for a way out. Everyone's trying to move. Everyone's sunk in sorrow about it. Um, or, or at least, res you know, at the very best, they're just resigned because they can't imagine anything else happening. I imagine us here in New York rising up the way we did, with, the way Harriet Tubman did, the way uh, the women suffragettes did, and insist on a better way. And insist. <laughs> we can insist that we will not be the human sacrifices for yet another form of getting, turning on the lights by drilling down into the earth and blasting it apart for carbon. The best science shows us that we can entirely run our economy on renewable energy in 20 years time if we were only willing to reduce our energy consumption by half. Now our energy consumption is exactly double that of Europeans and I think they're doing fine, at least in terms of their lifestyles. Um, and so if we could redesign our ways of life, we could 
uh, obviate the need for any of this. It turns out that natural gas is the, the, and the low cost of it and the abundance of it is the, current, is the number one reason that we're not investing in renewable energy, such as wind and solar. So natural gas is not a bridge to those things. It's a wall. It's an obstacle. Um, and the more we invest in natural gas, the less we're investing in renewables. We have good data, good economic data on this. So the scientific data and the economic data both show us the way forward. And I think we New Yorkers can stand up, as we always have, don't frack with us, right? That's what New Yorkers say. And, and, and we can lead the world in this. So um, I'm going to ask Elijah, will you bring my bag over here, the, the um, Wegmans bag that has my little, this is what um, replaces my PowerPoint. So that's my real life son Elijah for, the book, for whom the book having, Raising Elijah is named. And this is what this kid is made of. These are the, some of the things that were in his school lunch this week. This is water from my tap in Trumansburg, and it comes from an aquifer right along Cayuga Lake. Um, and in this are 29 parts per million of trihalomethanes and a, a kind of disturbing number of, of nitrates. So this water is already contaminated, um, not illegally so, but, you know, worryingly, uh, because what it shows us is that it's a vulnerable aquifer. The nitrates are almost certainly from fertilizers, and the trihalomethanes mean that there's some kind of carbon in here that's uh, turning into chloroform when we, chlor when we uh, chlorinate the water at the water treatment plant. Um, and so that means that um, there are hidden connections between what we do at the surface of the earth and the groundwater aquifer hundreds of, of feet uh, below that. So it's a vulnerable aquifer. And, and what will be in this water if all the land are, that's around this aquifer, and 40% of the land uh, in uh, Tompkins County is all leased up by the gas industry, what happens if that turns into some of the slides that you just saw as in the state of Pennsylvania? Okay, this water, drunk by my son, this is his blood plasma. These are his tears. This is his cerebral spinal fluid. These are his, the, his, the steam in his, ex, his exhaled breath on a cold day. This is my son. So you contaminate this water, you're contaminating my kids. Here's some bread that we made into sandwiches for lunch uh, from the Wide Awake Bakery. This is wheat grown right here uh, in Finger Lakes, um, made by bakers um, who can make a profit doing that. The baker tells me this is about 60% water by weight. So the water in here is also the water in here. And this is the muscles of my children. This is the, the calories they burn. This is their blood cells. This is their hair. This is their fingernails. This is their neurons. And this was the cheese in that sandwich, uh, which came from um, one of the farmstead, uh, the Miranda Cheese Company in Waterloo, New York. Uh, this one is cheddar. That's kind of a big star in our household. Um, and so this is the protein that my kids turn into their bones. The skeletons of my children are made out of this. Uh, the sparkle in their eye is caused by these guys, uh, which also peaches and red uh, peppers bought at the local farmer's market. So what we love, uh, we must protect. I love my kids. My kids are made out of this land, and I feel called upon to protect them. So as a lot of you heard, um, I had this happy news this week that I'm a recipient of a Heinz Award, which comes with this sort of stunning check, I uh, uh, haven't received it yet, for $100,000. Um, and when I got this news, I, I kept thinking, how different am I than other people who want checks from, the gas lease, from their gas leases? So I felt that, um, as a person who's a cancer survivor myself, and if any, all those of you who are know that it's hard to save any money um, when you uh, are constantly paying co-pays and, uh, and your insurance industry refuses to pay for this and that. It's kind of financial death by a thousand cuts. So I've never enjoyed a lot of financial security. But investing that money, the best thing I felt like I could do with it is to invest it in the fight against fracking. Because without, uh, without this, I don't have my kids. I don't have myself. And life itself is assaulted. So I announced yesterday and announce again tonight my intent to devote uh, the prize money 
to the fight against fracking in the hopes, I mean, it's a small amount of money. You have to hear this last part, all right? It's a small amount of money compared to what Chesapeake Energy is bringing to this. It's a big amount of money to me, more than I've ever had before, but small amount of money. It only will work if you two join me in bringing everything you can and in doing something big and doing something heroic. Because if you ever wanted to be a hero, if you ever wanted to be a member of the French Resistance, if you ever wanted to run the Underground Railroad or imagine yourself doing something really heroic, now is your moment. This is the time that we can be the heroes and stand up. We can stop fracking. It can be stopped and it must be stopped. But it is the 11th hour and it's going to take all of us together. So please join me. Talk about a good segue. We're going to be passing a basket around um, for donations. And for all $100,000 checks, I think they'll be in the basket in the back for you. Um, before our last speaker, I wanted to uh, thank our sponsors, not only for uh, an appreciation for what they've done in putting this great forum together, but also as a sort of an example of the broad range of, uh, of groups and people, especially around here at Cuca Lake, uh, and businesses that, that took part. The Bath Peace and Justice Coalition to Protect New York, Committee to Preserve the Finger Lakes, Concerned Citizens of Ulysses, Finger Lakes Move On, Gas Free Seneca, Heron Hill Winery, um, Hunt Country Vineyards, Cuca Citizens Against Hydrofracking, Cuca Lake Watershed Action Committee, La Belle V, B and B, McGregor Winery, People for a Healthy Environment, Otsego 2000, Shell Shock Action Alliance, and Sustainable Otsego.